Gregory McGuire, great to have you, first of all. PBS's Book View Now set, welcome. Thank you so much, glad to be here. Yeah, I love talking with you. The new book, After Alice, another in your incredible series of reimagined fairy tales. Well, tell us a little bit first about uh, how you got excited about Alice. Well, Alice in Wonderland is 150 years old this year. It was published in 1865, so it's an anniversary of sorts. 20 years ago, when Wicked came out, uh, my editor and my agent said, after its surprise success, said, oh, why don't you do Alice next? And I said, wait a minute, L. Frank Baum is, is a good writer and he's contributed to American culture, but Lewis Carroll is a genius. You know, I'm not going to rewrite Shakespeare, I'm not going to rewrite Emily Dickinson, and I'm not going to play with Lewis Carroll. He's too good. It's perfect. That's interesting that you felt intimidated by these people that you play with. I, I was deeply intimidated by oh. genius. I, I tend to be. But 20 years on, I've actually become more humble, if you can believe it. And uh, one of the things that's happened is that I, uh, I realized there's nothing I can do that could possibly erode the significance and the beauty and the comedy of Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass. So why shouldn't I just have fun? Yeah. I'm old enough to have fun now. I've been well, in you, business long enough. That's what you do. You have fun. And I mean, it your was books, fun. It clearly feels as if you, when you read your books that you're having fun as a writer. I mean, it, when you start to go through the story and think about you writing it, I can see you enjoying that process. I laugh out loud. And I always wrote for myself as a kid. I mean, when I was in fourth grade, I started writing because I was bored with life and I wanted to have fun. I, I, I was fairly restricted in childhood. I uh, couldn't go out much, so I had creative play therapy without knowing what it was called by writing when I was a kid, and I still enter my work zone with a spirit of play. Now, the interesting thing about After Alice is that, as with a lot of books that I, that I do, if there's something about the original that still speaks to me in the way that, say, old music, the music of your teenage years still speaks to you even when you're 60 or 70 or 80, uh, what I do is I try to look at it and find a little strand of the author's original DNA, narrative material, that is available for me to tug at. And in this instance, Alice in Wonderland seems all alone in her adventures. But there are two things that we know about her from Lewis Carroll. One is that she has an older sister who is reading to her on the, on the riverbank, a boring book. And the second is, in chapter two, Alice thinks, I don't feel like myself. But if I'm not myself, who can I be? Well, I'm not Ada because Ada has ringlets and my hair goes straight. Well, here's Lewis Carroll's DNA secret message to Gregory Maguire 150 years later. He's saying, Alice has a friend and her name is Ada. So what is happening to Ada on the day that Alice disappears? And what is happening to her sister who loses track of the girl she's supposed to be babysitting? After Alice is how both of those characters go after Alice. One of them throughout Oxford looking for her and getting more and more distressed. The other, Ada, goes down the rabbit hole after Alice to see if she can find her. I love that. Fascinating that you feel that sort of communique from beyond from Lewis Carroll and you it's an obviously an, it's a homage but the fact that you think that hard about it is wonderful. And you're, you're, you're absolutely right Rich in that it is an homage, and that's what the title is meant to be, too. It's, it's after Alice. It's after the style of Alice. It's right. published after Alice, and the girls are going after Alice. They're, they're looking for her. Yeah. Uh, I think homage is a, is a great word. And when what you think about... fan fiction now. You, you do call yeah. it fan fiction, but not if you're getting paid for it. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> I'm very happy with Morrow and Harper you know, to, to actually right. sign me up for and, and pay me for having fun. But the interest, another interesting thing about this book is I never think of myself as doing pastiche stuff. But what I do try to do is to enter into the zone of my memory of childhood reading. And Alice in Wonderland, I don't know. Actually, let me ask you. Did you read Alice when you were a kid? No, never read it. I, in fact, I didn't become familiar with Alice until I saw the Disney movie and then went back and read Alice. Well, I don't, I don't know then if my question is going to be legitimate. But Alice in Wonderland is a kind of scary book for people who were raised in the fantasy um, genre as I was in the, in the 60s who had Narnia to go to and Middle Earth and even Earthsea and, and Neverland. 
and Oz. All of which I read and loved. Wonderland was far more absurdist, far more yeah. Kafka-esque. It kept not adding up. And as a child reader, you read to add things up because you need to know the secrets of the world more than you knew before. Right. Af Alice in Wonderland does not give them to you. But you have to surrender yourself you to surrender it. You surrender yourself to it, and that's scary for kids. Yeah. So I tried to actually plug into some of that subterranean terror. Right. What if we do live in an absurdist universe? It feels like it to a kid, but what if you grow up as an adult and find, oh, that was true. Oh, Lewis Carroll was actually sending bulletins from the front. Adult <laughs> life is absurd. I love that. So when you d decide to dive in, obviously this one, you had to get over the hump and say, Lewis Carroll, genius or not, I'm coming. Absolutely. And that took some time, but there you are. That whole process, though, of embracing another fairy tale, I mean, there's a lot to choose from. Do you just sort of wonder or... Where do, when do you, what does it come? Well, how do you say, this is the one, I'm going there? Well, I, I actually resisted it for a long time uh, until the notion of the anniversary came up. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, well, it does, it does make sense. Maybe Lewis Carroll is, is talking to me. Uh, and then I began to realize that we, we were reaching the anniversary of Darwin, of, of the great uh, Oxford debate about evolution, which happened just a year or two before Alice in Wonderland was published and I think may have had some impact on Lewis Carroll being able to think about talking animals and being able to think about Alice herself changing from one kind of creature to another. Do you remember the scene in Alice where the du they're at the Duchess's house and she's rocking the baby and then it turns into a pig yeah, and, it, and it runs away in the forest? Yeah. That, is like, that is like so scary. That's so de Chirico. That's so... <laughs> Uh, that's so Salvador Dali. Exactly. It's so 20th century and surreal. And I wonder how much of that came from the notion of backwards evolution. Yeah. Thinking about evolution in the first place. I mean, Lewis Carroll was very smart. And he was plugged in as an Oxford Don. He was plugged into what the, the leading crest edges of intellectual thought were. Yeah. And it happened right there in Oxford. How could you not slice the things together? I love that. What I love about the, also the other element of this is that you're, each of these artists that you're reimagining, that you're playing with, have their own style. You mentioned Salvador Dali. I mean, Lewis Carroll was who he is. Al Frank Baum was who he was. You sort of helicopter into their world and sort of take stock and set up camp and then start to play. But it's always within their pastiche, their world that you're playing within? Well, what I, what I really try to do is two things. I try not to write skits for Saturday Night Live or for the old Carol Burnett show. I mean, I right. try not to make fun of the original because the only reason I'm doing it is that I revere the original. It still speaks to me. As I said, my parents were strict. We actually didn't listen to pop music when I was a teenager. Uh -huh. So I can't go back to that and think, ah, oh, those were the palmy days. Yeah. What I did was go to the library and I read these things. Those are the things that evoke youth and, and the sudden revelation of meaning to me. Yeah. And that's why they still speak to me now that I'm you know, entering my seventh decade, or is it my eighth decade, I'm not sure. Uh, we're settling. I, we're settling. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're settling for grace and wisdom. That's right. Um, but I do, I do think it's not, um, it's not making fun of it. And I'm always trying to honor the original and say my book, After Alice, can stand side by side with Alice in Wonderland and never hector it or never try to steal its thunder, but live comfortably in its shadow as a, as a distant, decadent cousin. When you think about those other stories of yours, do you even notice anymore when you're driving around New York and you see the cab with the Wicked on top, or, and you see, I mean, <laughs> Wicked has become such a phenomenon that you began, it's grown into this thing of its own giant being, but do you even notice it anymore? I mean, it's a world that's like yours, but yet it's almost Well, I, I, not. I do notice it. I think of it as being a little bit like the Starship Enterprise. Yeah. Like if the Starship Enterprise were to, you know, slowly float over the Javits Center, yeah. that would be like what Wicked sometimes does in yeah. my life. It just kind of floats over and it hovers. And I live in its green shadow. Uh, and some, in some ways, that's comfortable. And certainly, it's given me a fan base. Uh, in other ways, I. Yeah. I try to claw away from it. Now it's old enough, and I'm old enough, that 
uh, I, I feel I can leave it behind and say, so long, fellas, yeah. you know, goodbye, ladies. It's, you know. it's, it lives on its own. It lives on its it own. It almost doesn't need you, even though you're the father. It doesn't need me. It's, yeah. it's self-funding, it's self-propelling, and it will go on long after I'm dead. And I'm glad to be out in, in the clear and murky light of New York City right. uh, talking about another magic land that in some ways is, is more 21st century than Oz could ever be. Uh, it's a wonderful world. After Alice is the book. So glad to have you here, Gregory. I can't wait for our readers to find this book. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Rich. It's yeah. always a pleasure to it see you. It was great. Great to see you.